The leader explained here the people often build as much as they have money for and then pause the project until they they've earned enough to work on it and fix some more. <coughs> some of the sites though looked like they had been completely abandoned. Weathered beaten construction, overgrown weeds were saying that these owners had started, but for whatever reason, were unable to finish. Jesus said in Luke 14, 28-30, Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first step down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, Everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, This person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Jesus was cautioning us, too. Have you thought about what it will cost you to follow me, to make me not only Savior, but Lord of your life? It will be tragic if you decide later on that I am asking too much. And you walk away and I abandon and and uh, you walk away and abandon the life you started with me. First, consider the cost. I wonder how how do you and I consider the cost of following Jesus? Missionary Ann Carmichael once said, Count the cost, for he tells us to. But take your slate to the foot of the cross and add up the figures there. If you have ever have never before counted the cost of following Jesus, I urge you in these moments to take your slate to Calvary. Add up all it cost you to surrender your life to Christ and compare it to the tremendous price he paid on that tree and the riches of grace and eternal life that he offers. You will never regret offering up your life in a small repayment of all he did in taking your sins and your punishment. And if you have already begun building a life with Christ, commit yourself afresh to him as we worship together at the foot of the cross. Let's pray. Father, we are we thank you so much for this time. We are humbled by this opportunity to come before this table, Father, to partake of these emblems. <clears throat> this loaf and this cup, which represents the body and blood of Christ, that given for us, Father, to cover us for all our sins. Father, we thank you so much for this sacrifice and this love. We thank you for Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take these emblems together here this morning. Let's first take the bread. This represents Jesus' body. Thank you. Let's now take the cup. This represents his body. Let's take the next few moments and just meditate on the
we also have got the resource day to also bring back our tithes and offering. It's our act of worship as well. Um, uh, scripture talks about money and um, the things that we're provided for. And that um, Scripture talks about being stewards and being good stewards of those things. Uh, so we give you an opportunity, so or say, to bring back a portion of what you, you've been blessed with and give that back to God. And so we're going to do that here again this morning. The offering plays are in the back of the auditorium. If you haven't already put those offerings in, you can do that as you leave here today. If you're with us online, you would like to give. Also, you can get through our app or our website, through your own bank, you mail it here, or you can bring it by. So let's pray now for our offerings as our act of worship here today. Pray with me. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you so much um, for the way that you do bless our lives. Uh, we've been in the sermon series, we're talking about being blessed and talking about blessings. And Father, we're so thankful for the way that you do bless our lives. And um, sometimes those blessings are hard to see, and because we allow things to crowd into our lives, um, that clouds that um, vision of, of what's, what's been going on in our lives. And Father, just help us see that clearly. Help us understand that you are in control of all things, and that you, um, you own everything, and that it all belongs to you. So as we get back here today, we ask you to bless um, the hand that is able to give, that is or not able to give, but Father, that these funds would use for the building up of your kingdom. So help us use it wisely. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, today is Grandparents Day. Before we dismiss the kids, I'm going to have some volunteers going to come up and help me pass out some things. And so, don't wait any longer. Come on. And so, if you're a grandparent, um, should I get you to stand? Well, let's have all the grandparents stand. If you can, stand, stand for a second. Um... um Grandparents, great grandparents, just pay. If you're a grandparent, no, I'm not a grandparent. Huh? Oh. Okay, don't give it to me, though. Okay, and if you can't say any longer, you can go ahead and say it, but raise your hand so they'll bring, and they'll bring you down. Three different types. And while they're doing that, we're so thankful for our grandparents, but I have a video I'd like to show. Being a grandparent is, I, I'm sure, is a great honor, yeah. um, a great privilege. Uh, I remember a, um, a missionary, in my missionary class, we had a, a guy, he said, one of his, his hardest men, a job as a missionary is getting people to take him um, seriously about what he's doing. Because in their culture, uh, knowledge comes from age. And he says, until a person becomes gray, with, with age and knowledge, they begin to listen. He said, it just was like a light bulb that went off, you know, for him um, there and with the people. And so don't miss the opportunities that you have, that when you're doing all of this, your grandkids and pouring into your grandkids' lives and your great-grandkids' lives and your children's lives is because you're doing it all for him and that you want them to see Jesus in you. And so we're so thankful for you. And we, uh, it's a great way to celebrate you here today. So, at this time, kids are dismissed to go to the church. We've been looking at this guy named, named Jacob for a long time, and it seems like now he's a really old man, but we still haven't got that far yet um, in our story. Um, as I was looking at this story today that I want us to look at, we're going to wrap this up next week, but as we get to this particular story, 
It's interesting that the story we're going to look at today is wedged between two stories. When we last saw Jacob, he had finally been reconciled with his brother Esau, and he was settling down in the land that, that, that God had promised him. And what happens next, as described in Genesis 34, is almost too grim and almost too grimy to even talk about in church, right? Jacob has one daughter named Diana, and she is raped by one of the local boys, Shechem. His brothers, Simon and Levi, they go berserk. They end up massacring every man in the town, and the brothers join them in looting. And then verse 30 through 31 tells how the story ends. Look at this. I'm going to put it on screen for you. It says, Then Jacob said to Simon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me by making me stench, making me a stench to the Canaanites and the Perizzites, the people living in this land. We are few in number, and if they join forces against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. But they replied, Should we have should we he have treated our sister like a prostitute? What would an event like that do to a person, let alone a parent who was a man of God? Frederick Buckner, in his novel about Jacob's life, it was, it's entitled Son of Laughter, has Jacob say this. I'm gonna put on screen for you. I think I put a slide for this as well. It says the bitterness and the terror that was in the blood of the slain men of Shechem seeped through their skin and into the blood of their slayers and to all of us. It, it became our bitterness and terror and taint. We were an abomination in the sight of the fear God. We are an abomination in our own sight. We avoided each other's eyes and touched, uh, touched like the eyes and the, eye, and the touch of lepers. And we were like rats gibbering and scurred and scuttling along the wreckage we had made of ourselves. We have that story. And then on the other side of this, the story we're going to look at today, we have Genesis 35, 16 and following. The love of Jacob's life, Rachel, dies after giving birth to his son. She lives long enough to give him, uh, give him a name that means son of my sorrow. Jacob mercifully changes the name to Benjamin, which means son of my right hand, or my favorite son. To make matters worse, worse Jacob's eldest son, Reuben, sleeps with one of Jacob's concubines, Bilhah, and a blatant grab for power in the family. Soon thereafter, Isaac, the father of Jacob, and Esau dies. It is in the middle of all this sin and sorrow that we have today's text. Um, over the years, as I've been in ministry, then this has happened. This has played out multiple times. But one time, I go in the course of talking to a family, they told me that they had three children who had been strong in their faith through high school, had all walked away from the Lord, leaving behind them a trail of broken marriages, affairs, children born out of wedlock, bankruptcy, and even occultism. On the, as you might imagine, in the light of that burden in life, a day later, I talked to two other friends whose, whose wife had just was diagnosed with cancer and had surgery right around the corner. And the other, someone whose spouse had just died. Situations like this are disorienting. A person doesn't know where to turn, what, what to even do. And I wonder, where do you turn when you face devastation on one side and sin on the other? heartbreaking sorrow and on the other side. I believe our text today tells us where to turn. If you'll open your notes here this morning and fill in the blanks this morning, I'm going to give you three things. When trouble overwhelms us, God reminds us to return to Him. Return to Him. The night after the Shechem massacre uh, uh, must have been a very long night for Jacob. Didn't know what he was going to do. Perhaps it was that very night that God spoke to him as recorded for us in Genesis 35, verse 1. Look what it says. It says, Go up to Bethel and settle there and build an altar there to God who appeared to you when you were fleeing from your brother Esau. Do you remember when that happened? We talked about it for a few sermons back. And it's a story for us found in Genesis chapter 28, 10 through 12. Remember, Jacob had tricked his brother. It's stolen his, his, his blessing, right, and from Esau. And so he was running away from him. Thought Esau was going to kill him. And he stopped in this, to sleep in this desolate place. And he had a dream that night 
there he saw angels going up and down from the heavenly stairs where God stood at the top and he spoke. Look what it says, Genesis chapter 28, starting verse 13, it says, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth, and you will be spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. And Jacob called that place Bethel, which it means house of God. And he built an altar there. And then, remember, he made a vow, right? Remember his vow? Vows found for us in verses 20 and 22. 22 it says, If God will be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so, I, so that I return safely to my father's house, then the Lord will be my God, and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house, and, all, and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. Now, after the horrors of Shechem, God calls Jacob back to Bethel. You know, God is like that, right? See, Joyce Baldwin writes, Bethel stood for everything that really mattered. There is a place like that for us as well. I think C.S. Lewis once wrote in, um, in the, the article that he wrote, it said, The Problem of Pain. Look what he says. He said, God whispers to us in our pleasures. Speaks to us in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is in his it is in his mega, it is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Lewis was writing about how God uses pain to try to get the attention of bad men, but I believe pain also gets the attention of forgetful Christians. I think forgetfulness was Jacob's problem. Scholars think that Jacob and his clan lived in Shechem. As long as, been back as much as 10 years, decades before, he had made a vow to God at Bethel, and he had never returned to fulfill that vow. And when I read between the lines, I see a spiritual carelessness and casualness in Jacob's family. See, his family grew up without a sense of God's presence. They knew about their covenant with God, but idols were being worshipped in their community. And no one gave it a second thought about having those other gods. The murderous revenge carried out by Jacob's sons also shows just how out of whack these grown children had become. It was pain then that finally got Jacob's attention um, in our text. God is only at the center of our lives if we keep him there at the center of our lives. Sadly, it's easy to shovel him off to the side. You know how it is. Life is busy. We have lots of things that we need to get done. There's this and that that all need to be done today. It's always one thing after another. But it's going back to a holy place to have a personal revival. Who has time for that? Well, it's far harder than starting a diet. But then sin or sorrow has, has shut down all of life's delights, closing the doors of escape, God beckons us back to himself. And he's whispering, I'm waiting for you. I'm waiting for you. Maybe you know that feeling here this morning. The second thing I want us to see, when, when we must go back to God, we're forced to search our souls. Search our souls. Before Jacob sets out, he puts his spiritual house in order. Look at what Jacob did the morning after he heard from the Lord. Look what it says. Genesis chapter 35, starting verse 2, it says, So Jacob said to his household and to all who were with him, Get rid of the foreign gods you have with you and purify yourselves and change your clothes. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all the foreign gods they had and the rings in their ears, and Jacob buried them under the oak at Shechem. How does something like that, this translate into our own experiences? See, some people have security guards, but everyone 
has security gods. Before we return to the Lord, we must get rid of our security gods. See, Jacob had been living with these idols and other religious paraphernalia for years. You remember that Rachel had stolen her father's household gods, thinking it wouldn't hurt to have a little bit more extra security in her, her life, right? They didn't choose those idols instead of God, at least not in their own minds. Those gods were just a little added security to whatever God would provide for them. See, they didn't choose those gods instead of God, at least not in their own minds, right? They wanted that extra security. It, it used to be easier to, de de to identify idols in our lives, right? Because people used to give them bodies and hands, but now idols wear, wear almost an invisibility cloak around them. They're, they're there. They're on our mantles. They're beside our beds. But we just can't see them. So the regional marketing position for uh, uh, could be a god, for example, or the prestige of an advanced degree. For some, the pursuit of health could be your religion. For others, it is finding the power of that true self. When I asked God to show me my invisible God, it was, I saw an ugly little wart of a God that I had ever since I was a kid. What's yours? What's yours? Before we go back to a holy place with God, we have to root out the other gods that have wormed their way into our lives and bury them under that old oak tree. Next, we have to come clean. Jacob said to all the people, purify yourselves and change your clothes, in verse 2. For Jacob's household, the ceremonial washing and putting on clean clothes was an outward sign of, of the need that they need an inward change. Some of us have a favorite t-shirt, right? We have a t-shirt we like to wear. It's old, it's ratty. You wear it on your day off or when you're, when you're going to do some work and, and, and you're really going to get dirty. Maybe your spouse even keeps telling you, you need to get rid of that shirt. That's ugly. You shouldn't be wearing it anymore. But it's comfortable. Now, you don't mind the stains. Our souls are like that. Our souls are like that. Our inner life has spots and spudges and stains picked up from who knows where. Maybe someone, uh, maybe something I watched left a stain. Maybe a, a snide remark left by another left another stain. Maybe a sly game I played so I could get ahead is behind a big grease spot on that shirt. And this is what I like to wear. I'm comfortable. I like the dress like this. It makes me comfortable. James chapter 4, starting at verse 8, tells us what Jacob told his family to do. Look what it says. It says, come near to God, and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up. Cleaning up for God, that can be very painful. It can be. We can't wash our sins and stains away ourselves. Only God can do that. But deep repentance is not easy. And it's not easy to throw away a shirt that you love to wear so much. Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 4, starting verse 22, You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul then tells us to put off things like lying and anger and stealing and loafing, unwholesome talk and bitterness, all so that we might put on things like kindness and compassion and forgiveness. Return to Jacob. We see what he says in verse 3. Then come, let us go up to Bethel, where I will build an altar who answered um, an altar to God who answered me in the day of my distress and who has been with me for wherever I have gone. Jacob looked back over all the ups and downs of life in his life and realized that God had been his one constant. When we look back over our lives, 
Well, see the same thing. God has always been there. We cannot help um, but think, God answered me in the day of my distress and has become with me wherever I have gone. And when we search our souls, when we, we will realize our debt, the debt we have to our God, He has saved us and He has been utterly faithful to us. Verses 5 through 7 show the final step in our soul searching. Look what it says. It says, Then they set out, and the terror of God fell upon the towns all around them, so that no one pursued them. Jacob and all the people with him came to Luz, that is Bethel, in the land of Canaan. There he built an altar, and he called the place El Bethel, because it was there that God revealed himself to him when he was fleeing from his brother. The final step is to bow before our altar to God. Our altar is the cross of Jesus Christ. There, this is no ordinary time of prayer. Here we bow low before God with the sacrifice of Jesus, our only hope for his welcome. And God does welcome us for Jesus' sake. We humble ourselves. We tell God of our love and our desire to renew our devotion to him. We push everything else out of the room. We put, we put time aside. All the while we wait in the presence of God. And we soon find that, that it is good to be back with the Lord. No matter what other turmoil or trouble there is around us, there is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. An odd verse in the text underlines the importance of such seeking too. Consider verse 8. He says, Now Deborah, Rebecca's nurse, died and was buried under the oak below Bethel. So it is named Alon Bakoth, Oak of Weeping. What in the world does this verse have to do with anything in this, in this passage? What's it doing here? Let me try to explain it. See, Rebecca was the mother of Jacob and Esau. Remember, her nurse was Deborah. Uh, she would have been well over a hundred years old at this time. She is only mentioned here in the Bible. Joyce Baldwin had the most intriguing explanation that I read. She said that the, re the really strange thing is not that Deborah's death is mentioned, but Rebecca's isn't. When Rebecca conspired with Jacob to deceive Isaac, her husband, she said she would take on herself any curse that came from it. Maybe that's what happened. But we never hear a Rebecca again. We only hear of her nurse. The subtle message to all, of, to all of us is that Rebecca never made it to Bethel, to the house of God, because she was faithless. Her nurse made it to Bethel, but, but she didn't, and she's forgotten. Remember, not everyone who makes their home among God's people makes it to God's last thing I want us to see is this. Even in the midst of life's worst disasters and sorrows, God will bless you. God will bless you. In the story, Jacob has done all he can do to return to God and to finally keep his vow. He is our model. Verses 9 through 13 tells us what God does in light of Jacob's actions. It says, after Jacob returned from Padan Aram, God appeared to him again and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob, but you will no longer be called Jacob. Your name will be Israel. So he named him Israel. And God said to him, I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and increase in number. A nation and a community of nations will come from you, and kings will come from your body. The land I gave to Abraham and Isaac I also give to you, and I will give this land to your descendants after you. Then God went up from him at the, at the place where he had talked with him. God appeared to him again and blessed him. Think of that for a moment. With all the blood and sorrow surrounding him, God blessed Jacob again. We can look at these verses from two angles. First of all, through Jesus, we experience what God promised to Jacob. Here God reiterates the change of Jacob's name to Israel. This is our heritage. By our faith in Israel's Messiah, this is our nation. 
Verse 11 is the language of the new creation. God says to Jacob that he first said to Adam and Eve, be fruitful and increase in number. Here is a fresh start. God saw, uh, God saw us in his mind's eye when he said this to Jacob. Verse 11 also says, kings will come from your body. It will be some 800 years before Israel would have any kings at all. At all. But they were Jacob's descendants. What's more important is that from that royal line of Jacob's son, Judah, would come Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. It was wonderful for Jacob to be the father of God's anointed kings, but it's far more wonderful to be the subject of that great king, Jesus. Verse 12 goes, goes on to once again promise the land of Canaan to Jacob, a land first promised to his grandfather and father. This is the land that Jesus would walk upon and the land to which Jesus will return. And this is our land too. It may be the, the center of our universe now. It may not be, but it will be. Jerusalem is our home too. Through Jesus, God gives us what he promised to Jacob. The second angle of the blessing is this. We come to God to refocus on his faithfulness to us and he meets us with with his fresh promises. We're the ones who need to do business here. We, all, we only hope that God will listen. But when we, you get along with God, surround, surrounded by trouble and sorrow, he will refresh his promises to you. You will open your Bible, and somewhere in your reading, God will speak to you directly. All of Scripture is ours. All of it. God speaks infallibly and lovingly to us. But God will, will somehow run a divine highlighter over certain promises for the hour that you are facing right now. He may take his time. He may even be silent for a while. But if you have a Bible, God is going to speak to you through it. And when you meet with God, with the old security gods buried deep under the oak tree somewhere, and your heart is washed and clean, build your altar and worship God. Remember how he answered you in the day of your distress and has been with you wherever you have gone. Refresh your vows of love and your loyalty to him, but do not leave till you heard him speak to you unless he, unless, until he really blesses you. The thing that will make this a landmark in your life, it's not that you went to meet him, meet with God there, but that he met with you. And this reminds me of a story that I read about. It, it, the guy goes on and says, uh, So I once led this monthly church service at a nearby retirement community. He said, I preached from Psalms 149 about our songs of praise to God. And after the sermon, I invited people to choose hymns that were particularly important expressions of that faith to them. The first one to speak up was Babe Johnson. Babe and his wife, Flo, are wonderful Christian people. Babe is an outgoing, so encouraging, so thoughtful. He also lives with a lot of pain. His hand went up immediately when I asked for the hymn suggestions, so I pointed to him, and he says, because he lives. And then I asked, is there some particular reason you like to sing that? And this is what he says, yes. Our son died when he was 40 years old. It was a extremely traumatic event. Struck me so very, very hard. We stood at the graveside service and God brought this song to my mind. And he said, it gave me hope and it lifted me up. Look at these words. I'm going to put on the screen for you. He says, this is what he said. He said, because he lives... I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know he hosts the future. And life is worth living just because he lives. And that was Babe's Bethel moment. That was his. Right in the midst of life's worst suffering, God spoke his promises no matter what sin, saturated disaster you're facing, or what devastating sorrow may lie ahead for you, God will be waiting 
to meet you with his blessing. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, in our lives we allow so many things to crowd you out. Father, help us today to return to you. To start afresh. Be like Jacob. Father, help us today. Uh, if there's some decision that we need to make, maybe this morning we need to accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. We need to do that. We need to come to Jesus. Come to the cross. Help us to do that here today. Maybe others here, Lord God, Father, we just, we need to be reawakened. We need to be revived. Uh, we need not to be apathetic in our walk with you. We need to just grow, grow closer to you. We need to surrender our lives to you. Whatever that might be, Father, we just pray here today for that decision we made before we dismiss. We're going to give a song of invitation. If that needs to be made public here today, Father, we just pray that that decision would be made. But Father, whatever decision needs to be made today, you would guide us, you would lead us. And once we make that decision, Father, help us to keep that, keep that promise, keep that promise to you. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing today as we conclude here this morning because he lives. And maybe there's some decision you need to make, some change you need to make in your life, whatever it is. Will you please stand with me? Will you come as we sing? <laughs> night, um, Airmen's Fellowship, and then again, Wednesday morning we have prayer group here, like the Bible, right to come and pray with us. Let's close with prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this day. Uh, thank you for the opportunity you give us to worship here as a corporate body. Father, as we leave now, be with us as we uh, uh, live this life you have called us to. And Father, we pray for opportunities to be able to share with others. Uh, we ask for courage to take up those opportunities. And Father, we just... Um, Pray for you just to show us what you would have us to do. And so, Father, we, we ask your blessings upon our dismissal and ask you to continue to be with us as we leave. We pray these things in Jesus' name.